oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Blessings and greetings in the name of the Most High God. And once again, it is time for our Bible study on Wednesday evening. We're going to ask that you would please now, please sir, uh, get your Bibles, your pen, your paper, and we're going to share a little while in the Word on this evening. And we just want to continue to minister on the new place of worship, and we're going to share and see what God has in store for us on this evening. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll press on this evening. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I come boldly to the throne of grace that I might find the help that I need in this moment and in this hour. Lord God, I acknowledge that without thee, I can do nothing. Father, I'm like a ship without a sail. Lord, I need you now more than ever before. Father God, it is my desire to have a fresh anointing upon my life as we begin to teach the word on tonight. Father God, I know that I cannot teach your word without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I cannot teach your word without, Father God, the leadership and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Father God, I ask that you will release a fresh anointing right now. Anoint not only me, but Lord, anoint also the hearer, Lord God. Father God, I ask that the Holy Spirit will bring back to my active memory everything that the Holy Spirit wants to be said in this time of teaching and studying the Word of God. Father God, open up the eyes of our understanding that, Father, we'll be able to see what you have for us in the Word, Lord God. Father, open up the ears of our understanding, Lord God, that we will be able to hear what you have for us, Lord God. Father God, open up our hearts, Lord God, that we will be able to receive your word in the richness of our heart, Lord God. We pray, Father God, that when your word falls within our hearts, Lord God, it will cause a supernatural growth to take place, Lord God. A growth in our faith in you, a growth in our confidence in you, a growth in us and our dependence upon you, Lord God. Father, we know that we need you. We cannot get along without you, Lord God. Father, we pray that after the hearing of your word, Lord God, that our lives should never, ever be the same. We pray, Father God, that after the hearing of your word on this evening, Lord God, that we will be able to share with other people, Lord, what we have learned in this moment, in this hour, in this time of breaking the bread of life, Lord. Father, this we ask in your son Jesus' name for his sakes. Amen. All right. We have been sharing about the new place of worship, uh, and we started in, uh, in part in uh, John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24, and dealing with the woman at the well with Jesus and how Jesus was ministering to this woman and the woman thought she was there to do something different. She had a different purpose in mind. But Jesus met the greatest need that the woman had on the inside of her life and changed her entire life as a result of it. And as of this one encounter with this one woman, the people in the area were affected by her testimony and her powerful witness about Jesus Christ. We started out in dealing with looking at the place of worship because Jesus said to the woman, you know, you're not going to worship. It's not about worshiping in the mountains. It's not about worshiping in Jerusalem. But God is going to have a new form of worship where we'll worship God in spirit and also in truth. And it would not necessarily be connected to a place per se, uh, but there are places of worship. And, and, and looking at that, and that's what spin off all the rest of what we're looking at and what we're studying tonight is because Jesus was talking about a different place of worship. And, and in order to look at that, we're going back and we're tracing it uh, just the highlights of it. We're not getting into every minute detail of it, but we just want to look at the highlights of the different places. And we're going to trace this and see how far we can go forward into the future to where we are today to where it makes a lot more sense and we have a good understanding of it all. Because the Bible declares in all that getting, get a good understanding. And I want to make sure that we take the time and ensure that you have a good understanding. Now, when we first got started, we went back into Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. This is where God begins to deal with Adam and Eve after the fall. God goes looking for Adam and Eve, and 
Adam said, Lord, I hear myself because we were naked. God said, how do you know you were naked? Did you eat from the tree? I told you not to eat from the tree. He said, well, it was a woman. And it goes on. But the conclusion of that chapter is that God sacrificed an animal to let Adam and Eve go free. And, 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 and it doesn't state that verbatim in words, but it does tell us he took the skin from the animal and dressed Adam and Eve and put them out in the garden. So there was a sacrifice was there, the word was there, and God was there, and man was there, and it was a designated place. So I believe that that is the origin of where worship came from. And, and, and the second place that we looked at in the Bible where it talks about worship is dealing with Cain and Abel when they brought a sacrifice unto the Lord. Now Cain's was accepted, Abel's was not. Cain gave what he had, he gave, but he did not give the right sacrifice. And secondly, he did not give it from his heart. Cain was given out of obligation. Abel was giving out of his heart and he offered the best that he had, and he offered the appropriate sacrifice unto God. So, so, so when you look at that situation, that it lets us know that sometimes when people worship, they're just doing it out of obligation, and they're not giving God their best. And then there are others who worship God, and they get to the right place of worship, and they give God the very best that they have in worship. Now, the third place that we looked at yeah, is dealing in uh, Genesis chapter 8 and dealing with Noah. Now, when you get to Noah, this is the first place in the Bible where it's mentioned that they have an altar. Now, previous before this, they might have had an altar, but an altar was never mentioned. In this case, now we go from learning not only is there a sacrifice, but there is also an altar that is present in worship. Ah, oh, I like this a lot. So, so we learned that from Noah. Now, remember, each of those texts that we looked at, those three texts, uh, the elements of worship are present. First of all, there is a place of worship. God is present in that place of worship. Man is present in that place of worship. And there is a sacrifice in that place of worship. And there is a word from God. Those five elements will appear in some form or some fashion in connected to worship experience. So every time you get into a worship experience, a worship encounter, you should have an expectation that there is a specific place, that God is going to be present, that man is going to be present, that there will be a sacrifice, and there will be a word. So expect that every time you enter into worship, expect these elements to happen. Now, this evening we want to begin to look at Abraham's four different altars in his life. Now, tonight we probably won't get to all four of them, but we'll get through as many as we can this evening, and then we will finish up next week on Abraham and looking at his four places of worship. Now, this is crucial and it's very, very important because when you get to Abraham, you begin to learn a great deal more about worship and, 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 and the type of worship that we end up with at the last altar of Abraham is a type and a shadow of Christ or it symbolizes Christ when you look at the last one. So first of all, let's look at the first place of worship. When you get to Genesis chapter 12, look at verse 8. And verse number six, really. Uh, I won't read all of these verses, but uh, uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse uh, six through eight, verse six through eight. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shittim, unto the plain of Myra, Myra, Myra and the Canaanites were then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, Thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east side of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Har on the east. 
And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, this is the first recorded record where Abraham is calling on the name of the Lord. Doesn't mean that he had not called on in the past, but this is the first recorded record in scripture that I found. Now, verse 9 said, And Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south. In other words, he continued to be a pilgrim in the land that he was in. Now, when you look at verse 6 through 8, God here is reassuring his promise, his promises to Abraham, both the promise of the seed and the promise of the land. God is affirming what he has already told Abraham. Now, what was Abraham's response when he got a word from God? The first thing that Abraham did was he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him in verse number 8. He says, there he built an altar unto the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. The God that showed up to him is the God that he built an altar to. Now, the altar that Abraham built has significance. It has relevance. It has importance. Because when you look at this, uh, it was to offer sacrifice to God and to ask for forgiveness from God. Ah, I love that. So he built that altar and he got ready and he wanted to offer up sacrifice to God. He did it to make a point of rededicating himself to God, renewing his commitment because God just came along and affirmed what he had already told him what he is going to do inside of his life. And you can expect God to affirm everything that he's already told you on the inside of your life. That's why you know that it's going to come to pass. He'll keep telling you over and over and over again. Um, he did it to seek God continually. because He did it to continue to seek God's presence and to be able to continue to seek God's presence. He had a place where he could go. And he could seek God and he could hear from God. That's why we would go to church on every Sunday. Why? We're going to a designated place where we can offer our sacrifices of praise unto him, where we can seek his face forevermore, where we can get guidance from him, where we can get a word from him. He did it to worship the Lord. He had a designated place where he could go and he could bow down himself before God. He did it to acknowledge the Lord that he was totally and completely dependent upon the Lord. He did it to praise the Lord, to praise him for all that God has given him. He did it to testify to the Lord, to bear witness to the Lord, glorious goodness in his life. And every single one of us can all testify to the goodness of God inside of our life. Whenever we come to church, whenever we come to altar, whenever we go to worship, it ought to be a time when we can testify and tell about the goodness of the Lord on the inside of our life. Now, the Bible goes on and lets us know in verse 9 that Abram, he continued to move around. In other words, Abram continued his pilgrimage. But when he moved, he built an altar to the Lord where he went. He didn't just go someplace and forget about the Lord. Wherever he went, he erected an altar. And Abram built an altar the very next place he went. The idea is that Abram was now, he was committed to God. He was seeking after God. And he was seeking after God's promises. So trust you me. You may not be able to be here at church, but you certainly ought to be able to do like Abraham. You know, you ought to be committed to God even though you're at home. You ought to still be seeking God even though you're at home. And yes, seek God's promises. If he's promised you that, you ought to be seeking after those promises. Now, whenever he moved, he built an altar, and which means that he established a place where he could worship God, a place where he could testify to God about how good he has been to him. Now, let me ask you this. Where is your place of worship at home? Where do you enter into worship at home? Where is your place where you go and you testify and tell God how good he has been to you? Now, when we look at this particular place of worship, what is it that I need you to take from this particular place of worship? What I need to take, first of all, a sacrifice was not mentioned, but it is implied. 
a sacrifice was mentioned, but it's implied. Worship is now connected to a godly lineage of people by a covenant relationship. If you go back to the beginning of Genesis chapter 12, you'll see the establishment of that covenant relationship between God and Abraham, which means that God selected Abraham out of everybody else in the world that he wanted to establish this covenant relationship with. Now, third thing I need you to remember is this. Worship can happen wherever the covenant people are. Worship can happen wherever the covenant people are. When Abraham moved his tent, he set up an altar and he worshiped God in the location where he moved to. So wherever you are as a born again believer, as a born again child of God, that is a place that has the potential where worship can happen and worship can take place. All right. That was his first altar. The second altar of Abraham is referred to as the altar of prayer. From over to Genesis chapter 13. And let's look at verse 1 through 4. Genesis 13, verse 1 through 4. And this is what they refer to theologically as his altar of prayer. Now, when we look at the end of chapter 12, famine hit the land, Abraham goes to Egypt, he lies, and has Sarah to lie, and say that Sarah is his, is his sister and not his wife, and Pharaoh wants to marry her, and, and then it turns out God has to intervene and play Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, look, why didn't you tell me, man, that this was your wife and, and not your sister? Look, take your wife, all your stuff, and you need to get out of here. Either. Look, don't y'all touch him, don't touch that man. So, so, so this is the backdrop of this and getting into verse in chapter 13, verse 1 through 4. And I want you to see what happens at the second altar of prayer. It says here, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, at the beginning, between Bethel and home, unto, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, understand this. Lot is tagging along with Abraham. Lot is tagging along with Abraham. All right? That's important. And that's vital because you need to remember that. That's a good principle to remember and something for us to talk about at a later date in time. We'll come back and talk about having people with you that should not be with you. Yes, love your family. But some family go, can't go where you go. Uh, now, they separated from Egypt from the world of ungodliness and worldly lusts. Genesis 13 and 1. They left Egypt. They left Egypt unharmed. They repented and began their journey back to the promised land, to Bethel. Bethel was the place where Abraham had begun his journey in the promised land and had built an altar for worship. So he goes back to his original place where he built the first altar, he pitched his tent back there again. And notice what he did when he got to that place. Notice what he did. There, Abram called on the name of the Lord. He felt a strong desire to reignite his faith with God. So he goes back to the place where he first got started, first started with his first altar, he goes back to that place and he began to call upon the name of the God, name of the Lord in that place. Now, it might be expressed that it was a point of humility and penance for his misconduct in Egypt, or thankfulness for his deliverance from Egypt. Because while he was in Egypt, not only he could have gotten killed, 
But Sarah, Lot, and everything else could have gotten killed in Egypt if God had not intervened. Now, to embrace the first opportunity on returning to Canaan of leading his family to renew allegiance to God and offer a typical sacrifice which points to the blessings of his promise. He gets back there, he offers his sacrifice, and he leaves his family back. I'm pretty sure he was grateful to be out of Egypt because he could have gotten killed in Egypt. Now, when you look at this in one situation, what is I need you to take away from this one situation this evening is this. This is very important. Don't forget this. In this case of worship, there is direct intervention by God to keep the worshiper alive before he offers a sacrifice unto God. There is a direct intervention by God to keep Abram alive before he even offers up a sacrifice. There's a direct intervention. Now, okay, look at Genesis chapter 12. Let's look at a few verses in here, verse 17 and 20, and, and I want you to see God's intervention into Abraham's folly. Uh, I was going to say foolishness, but folly sounds better. I'll say folly. All right. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 17 to 20. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why doest, why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So literally while he was there, God had to intervene. God had to step in. In the midst, even though he was wrong, even though he went in his right place where God had him to be, God still intervened in the situation to get him back to where he needed to be. Look, there is no substitute for your place of worship. There is no substitute for your place of worship. He was in Egypt, but his place of worship was in Canaan. So he was in the wrong place. So since he was in the wrong place, he got the wrong results in his life. And as a result of him getting the wrong results, God had to intervene to keep him from getting killed so that he could get back to his right place. You want to talk about a picture of God's grace and God's mercy. That is a picture of God's grace and God's mercy. Because God looked at what he did and he looked beyond what he did and saw the need in Abraham's life and he intervened in Abraham's life. God looks beyond you and I and what we do and he sees the need in our lives and he intervenes in our situation. Look, yes, I'm focusing on a new place of worship. But here Abram did not have that option available to him at this point and at this time. But we do. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get to the end of this. We'll make it all make sense. God is faithful. Even when Abram was unfaithful, he went to Egypt, which means he was unfaithful, which means that he was not trusting God. But he was putting his trust in Egypt. It's easy to be led astray when you're trusting human wisdom and human knowledge. You've got to learn how to lean and depend upon God. If God tells you to be in a place and a famine happened in the place, you need to go back to God and say, God, there's a famine in this place. Well, God will provide for you in the midst of a famine. 
the Bible declared that Isaac sowed in the land. The land was experiencing a famine, but Isaac experienced a hundredfold because Isaac was in the right place. And since he was in the right place, God had to bless him in spite of the famine that was in the land. Just because there's a famine in the land, it does not mean that there's going to be a famine in your house, in your home, in your life. If you are a child of God, you should not be experiencing a famine. You ought to say, God, if there's a famine, you need to fix me or fix whatever you got to fix. Fix that so I can experience the blessing of the Lord. According to Psalms of your thing, the Lord wants to bless you more and more and more. Not just you, but you and your children. God is faithful even when Abram was unfaithful. Why was God faithful to Abram when he was unfaithful to him? God is in a God is a covenant keeping God. He keeps covenant relationship. Now, Lot is still with Abram. And I believe that it was Lot that influenced Abram to go to Egypt in the first place. I have no Bible to back that up. I just believe he did. Because sometimes if you run with folk, they have an influence on your life. The people you hang out are the people that influence your life. They influence your behavior. They influence how you act. They influence how you live. They influence where you live. They influence what you drive. They have an impact on your life. Look, look at Genesis 12 and 1. Let me show you this. Look at this one. Genesis 12 and 1. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kin and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. When God called Abram, he didn't call Lot, and he didn't call Abram's father. God called Abraham to go on this pilgrimage to Canaan. He did not call Lot. So now, you got one that's called and one that's not. Because if you go back to Genesis chapter 11, you'll find where um, uh, uh, Abram, he left Canaan, not Canaan, but uh, or the Chaldees, along with his father and his nephew. And they got to Harm, and they stayed there. But as soon as his father died, that's when Abraham got up and came to Canaan. But if his father had stayed alive, he wouldn't have went all the way. So his father and Lot was influencing him to stay there. But as soon as his father died, now he gets up. And he moves on, and he goes to where God is wanting to be. You see, God is calling everybody, but he has not selected everybody. God is calling everybody, but he ain't selected everybody. Matthews 22 and 14 says, uh, For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, there was, look at this one, there were those that were, Call to the Jews. Let's say that. God sent out a call to the Jews, but only a few Jews respond. God sent out a call to the Gentiles. Only a few Gentiles respond. God has sent out a call in this present generation. Only a few respond. And you have to remember that Abraham, the call went out. Abraham responded to the call. So Abraham was selected because he responded in faith to the call. Lot did not respond to the call. Even if he heard the call, he didn't respond to it. Because when you look at Lot's life, uh, 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 eventually Lot's going to be separated from Abraham, and we'll talk about that next week, but he's going to be separated from Abraham. And he's going to be separated because he wasn't the one that God called. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Look, let me help you. You may have hundreds of people in your life but everybody can't enter into worship for you. You have to enter into worship for yourself. Oh, man, I tell you. Look, Abraham was called, but he was carrying an uncalled person along with him. Wow, okay. Let, let, let's be going with it. A sacrifice in this text was not mentioned, but it is indeed implied. A sacrifice was not mentioned, but it is indeed implied. 
A sacrifice is not mentioned, but it's implied. It's dangerous for you and I to be hooked up with people that are not saved. Because the people that are not saved will be the people that will influence us one way or another. If you're running with a crowd of unsaved people, the unsaved people will have a great influence in your life. If you're running with a crowd of saved people, the saved people will have the greatest influence in your life. So every time you make a decision like that, you have to be careful because it affects what lies ahead. Because what God had for Abraham was basically moving slower than maybe God wanted it to move. Because God was ready to bless Abraham beyond measure, but you got somebody with you that doesn't have the same kind of faith, commitment, and dedication to God that you have. And you have to kind of separate yourself from them. And I tell you what, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. The hour is far spent, and it's getting time for me to stop. But, but, but we'll talk about that next week, and we'll continue to share, and we'll pick up on Abraham's, Abram's third altar, which is the altar of communion. And, and we'll talk about that next week, and we'll get into the fourth altar of Abraham as well. And, and, and that's where I really want to be, but we've got to go through this to get to that. Let me say this. Uh, thank you so much for listening and taking the time to to tune in, to listen. I, I want you to like and I want you to share this video with other people. Uh, the more likes, the more shares, the better. You know, our goal is to reach the entire world with the Word of God, not just preaching, but also with teaching the Word of God with clarity and accuracy and, and to the point that we all can get a good understanding of the Word of God. It is imperative that you and I, we both have a good understanding of the Word of God. If we do not have a good understanding of the Word of God, we will not be able to apply the Word of God to our lives. And I want to make sure that we go with clarity throughout the study and get a good understanding of our various places of worship. Look, I'm looking forward to Friday. Friday, once again, we're going to be on Zoom at 6 o'clock. I want you to join us, tell somebody, bring somebody along with you. But we're going to just have a time for us to fellowship and to share with one another, to love on each other. We're not able to get together here physically inside the sanctuary, but Zoom gives us an opportunity where we can fellowship with each other, we can hear each other's voice, and if we like, we can even see each other on Zoom. You can log in on your tablet, you can log in on your computer, you can log in on your smartphone, or you can call in on your landline, but we do want to invite you, we want to extend that invitation for you to come fellowship with us, and yes, I'm looking forward to hearing from all the different questions that we asked you on last Friday. It's just a time for us to fellowship, to laugh with one another, and to have fun with each other as children of God. So I'm looking forward to that time. So trust you me, I cannot wait until Friday to get here. Uh, next Sunday will be our full Sunday. That's going to be our communion Sunday. You know, be prepared to take communion because we're going to celebrate communion next Sunday. And there is a word from the Lord that God has for me to share with you upcoming on the full Sunday. I don't want you to miss it. Look forward to it. Let me say this one last thing and I'm going to get out of here. Know that the Lord loves you. Know that he cares about you. Know that he's concerned about you. Know that he has never forsaken you and he shall never forsake you. Know that he is with you wherever you go. Know that Judas, Alan, and myself, we love you. We are praying for you. We are here for you. And we will see you on Friday. May the Lord bless thee. May the Lord keep thee. May the Lord watch over thee. May the Lord keep his hand upon your life. In Jesus' name we pray. And we'll see you on Friday. God bless.